back to that theme a little later in our presentation. So on our agenda for today, there's gonna to be a three-part presentation. I'm gonna very briefly talk about our online model for distance learning that we've been doing in Louisiana since 2014. From there, I want to present an idea for what the future of adult learning could look like, including various models that could be adapted in the kind of high flex environment. And then I will finish by kind of rapid fire going through 12 different strategies for supporting digital literacy and creating an online community. So with that, I want to kick it off. What did we learn building an online model in Louisiana? So first of all, um, we started our program in 2014 with 30 students, one staff member, which was me, um, and we retained one out of those 30 students, which if you do the math quickly is a 3% retention rate. So we struggled a lot early. Um, in 2015, we introduced a coaching model. So we had online instruction and then online coaches. Um, and that's when we started to kind of grow our program and we started to retain about half of our students session over session. So we were learning quickly and making progress. Um, and then we also added part time staff. And so we kind of grew our staff capacity around that time as well. In 2017, we partnered with our state agency to scale distance learning, which meant students anywhere in Louisiana could enroll with a local program, but then take classes online with students across the state. Um, eventually that year we reached our 500 student milestone and then we actually really built our staff capacity with full-time part-time staff member. Um, one thing I'll note is that our staff has been distributed since the outset. So starting in 2014, we've all been working remotely. Um, and so the past year and a half or two years of distance learning has been an opportunity for us to kind of scale our model as we've been doing it since 2014. Um, also in 2017, we hit a milestone that 90% of our students that completed a full session showed a measurable skill gain as measured through a TAE pre and post test. And then in 2019, we were recognized as the COAP State Innovation of the Year Award winner. Thinking about that kind of scaling model, I, I put this slide up just to kind of show who does what. So at our partner sites, um, they're responsible for intake, orientation, coaching, pre and post testing. And then where I work at Delgado as the lead agency, um, we do all of the curriculum de development, provide instruction, so forth. Um, I wanted to put this slide up because I'm going to talk about the partnership model later today. Um, but I also just kind of want to emphasize that we are a work in progress as well. I don't want this presentation to suggest that I'm the expert here. All of you have been doing distance learning and digital literacy for at least two years now, if not longer. So in a way, we are all experts here. I, I don't really think we figured out best practices in distance learning or digital literacy yet. Um, so essentially, I just kind of want to present some ideas, share what we've learned, and then hopefully turn this into an ongoing conversation where we are all learning from each other. Um, because distance learning and digital literacy and 21st century instruction is new for all of us. Um, and so this partner model is one strategy that I wanna share throughout today's presentation. And then to kind of sum up our e-learn model, we started scaling in 2017 and that's where you can find partners from around the state that would then enroll students locally and then take, student, take classes online with other students from around the state. And at this point, we're now serving about a thousand students annually through this distance learning model. So with that, I do wanna pause, see if there are any questions for our distance learning model. Please put those into the Q&A because uh, the chat will kind of grow quickly so it can be hard to track those. And I'm gonna provide some space at the end of the presentation to answer some of those questions about right now, for example, our distance learning model. Okay, so those of you that have been to my presentations before know that I always like to transition with digital literacy tips. And so here's one of my favorites, which is a quick way to create Google Drive files. So those of you that might work in Google Docs and Google Sheets and Google Slides regularly, here's a quick way to create a new file. Just go into the URL bar, like you're going to a website and type docs.new or sheets.new. I encourage you right now, if you're on a computer, Open up a new tab with that keyboard shortcut, control T or command T, and try creating a new file. Just type docs.new or sheets.new or slides.new, 
and it should automatically create one of those files. What's kind of great about this is if I'm in a meeting and I just want to jot down some quick notes, um, I can just open a new tab and type docs.new and instantly create a new drive file. So open a new tab, jump into the chat, let me know if these shortcuts are working. Sites.new, forms.new, slides.new, docs.new, the entire Google suite should work with this shortcut. Okay, transitioning on, I wanna kind of present an idea for how to explore potentially an evolved instructional model for adult education. So a common question that I get in my adult ed classroom is, how do I blank? How do I bold this sentence? How do I insert an image? How do I take a screenshot? How do I cross cancel? Um, so kind of thinking in that math classroom, I often hear students say, hey, show me the steps. This is a form of dependent learning where students need direct instruction in order to get started solving a problem. So how do I blank? Please show me the step-by-step -step process for how to take a screenshot, for example. But the challenge with dependent learning is that digital tools are changing so quickly. You know, what you can see on screen right now are a few different headlines just from the past month or so of feature updates on Google and Microsoft products. Kind of put another way, technology is changing too quickly for us to focus on the steps. Let me give an example. If I'm teaching a student how to use Google Maps and I say, hey, here's how you step-by-step -step find the biking directions on Google Maps, that process may change tomorrow because there could be a new feature or a new interface or a new process for how to do something. So kind of simply put, there's just too much content to cover to focus on dependent learning. It's not a sufficient instructional method for teaching digital literacy. Continuing on with some of the challenges that we see in adult education, nationally, 80% of our staff are part-time. Um, and on top of that, a lot of our staff are not confident digital users. Our staff are learning new digital skills alongside students. So if we think about what we're asking our staff to do, we want them to write curriculum, learn how to teach online, build relationships with students, and as we saw on the last slide, cover a lot of content. Additionally, we know that adult ed students enter our classrooms at different levels and have different needs. So a traditional one-size-fits-all instructional method um, isn't gonna work for a multi-level classroom. Furthermore, a recent study asked students how they typically learn. And you can see on screen, they were given different options like hands-on projects or group projects or independent study. And unsurprisingly, we found that the most common method for instruction was still lecturing. But we can see from the data that students themselves aren't looking for lectures. They're looking for more active learning experiences. And then interestingly, there was a study that explored the efficacy of three different instructional methods. One was lecture-based with one teacher, 30 students. One was mastery learning, still with one teacher and 30 students, but students had to demonstrate proficiency before they made progress to the next unit. And then the last was individual tutoring, which was one teacher and one student or a small group of students. And unsurprisingly, the individual tutoring was the most effective method. And that, that probably, um, you probably could have guessed that by thinking like, yeah, of course, if I could work one-to-one -one with every student, it would be the most effective method. But we don't really have the resources to really give every student an individual tutor. But what I find interesting is that mastery learning itself was also one full standard deviation more effective than a traditional lecture format for classes. Um, as a side note, you can see in the bottom right here, this study was done in 1984. So we've known for over 30 years that lecturing is not the most effective method for teaching. And then finally, um, a recent study put out by um, kind of World Education and Pro Literacy found that there's been a 30 to 60% drop in attendance during COVID. 
So we know it's been a challenge to engage and retain our students. So kind of as a summary of some of the challenges that we are seeing in adult education. We know that students are entering our classrooms as dependent learners. They wanna be shown the step-by-step -step process for how to solve a problem. We also know that technology is changing quickly and the rigor of the high set or the GED or the task has changed. And so um, the skills needed may not be sufficient with the methods we've used. Continuing on, um, our staff are part-time and not necessarily native to digital environments. Time with students is scarce and they are entering our classrooms as multi-level learners, but our staff are still largely lecturing, even though we know lectures and traditional models don't work. So the natural question here is, what do we do about it? So I would like to present a theory. I would like to present an idea that our goal in adult education should be to nurture independent learners. An independent learner is someone that can set goals, find resources on their own, ask for help when they need it, be confident when they make mistakes, reflect on their skills, and build new skills independently and collaboratively. So kind of simply put, I think our goal is to future-proof where our students and staff are able to continuously learn across a lifetime. And the challenge then becomes, great, that sounds awesome, but how do we do that? And interestingly, I think it's already happening. If you go into the chat right now, scroll to the top, and you're going to find dozens of examples of how our colleagues across the country are independent learners. We have people that are going to YouTube to learn how to do a VLOOKUP, to fix a drain, to play an instrument. In my opinion, YouTube is the best school in the history of the world at its core it's teachers and students getting online to learn collaboratively. And I find that our students are doing this too. Our students know YouTube. They use Instagram and WhatsApp to share links with friends and family. And so the challenge here is not like, can our students be independent learners? We know they can because we know our students already use YouTube. The challenge is how do we help our students realize that they are independent learners? And they can translate what they do at home in their personal lives into the classroom and into work. So I want to share a story that early on when we started our distance learning program in Louisiana, I had a student that came in, took all five sections of the high set, we're a high set state in Louisiana, and passed all four subjects, or passed every subject except for social studies. So the student and I jumped on the phone. Remember, this was a fully online program. And she was like, hey, when is the next social studies class coming out? And I was honestly like, hey, not anytime soon. I'm way too overwhelmed. Retention is a challenge. I'm building all of our online classes. I am, I'm just struggling. So I don't have time to build a new social studies class. But I said, look, let's go on to YouTube. And I introduced a great channel called Crash Course, which if you haven't heard it, please go check it out. It's awesome. It's filled with high quality, well edited, really engaging short videos on pretty much every topic you can imagine. So I said, hey, check out Crash Course. I want you to go to the High Set website and figure out what are the different topics covered on the High Set. You know, every test publishes like we're 20% economics, we're 20% US government. Go out to the High Set website, figure out what's on the social studies section. And then let's collaborate and build a YouTube playlist together. So essentially, she did the research. She went to YouTube. She built her own YouTube playlist covering the lessons that she was going to study to retake the social studies section. Then I put together a very basic Google Doc guide. Essentially, what, uh, what video are you watching? What's a summary of it? And what questions do you still have after watching that video? So kind of, again, they built their own social studies class using nothing but YouTube videos. And they went back a month later, retook the high set and passed the social studies section on their second try. And this was essentially a month of independent learning. Now, I don't want to suggest that every adult learner is ready to build their own YouTube playlist or ready to drive their own education forward. But what I want to do emphasize is that I learned a lot of lessons from that experience that, hey, 
technology is amazing. YouTube is incredible. Maybe my role as a teacher has changed in the 21st century. Maybe I don't need to write all of my content because YouTube has a lot of great content. Maybe students are capable of driving some level of their learning forward. But remember, the student wasn't doing that on their own. I was helping them. I was introducing you crash course. So I had a great curated resource ready. I helped them set goals. I helped them structure their studying experience. So maybe my role in the 21st century has shifted. Maybe my role is no longer delivery of information, but helping students learn how to learn, helping students become independent learners that can drive their own education forward. So I wanna talk about how we can start practicing this kind of independent learning in our own classrooms later today or tomorrow for those of you that might have a class coming up. So at a very high level, as we looked at with the YouTube activity, content explanations or lectures can happen any time now. And as we know, time in class with students is incredibly scarce. In my classroom, I only get to see my students twice a week, usually for an hour or 90 minutes per class meeting. And then that's it for the week. So maybe I see them three hours a week. That time is precious. So the first idea I wanna introduce is instead of using time together for explanations, direct students to those explanations before or after class. Now let's take this a little deeper. What can this look like? So first of all, blended instruction. Students can access lessons before and after class. So that could be a YouTube video that they watch right before class. Secondly, flexible pacing. Students can move back and forth as needed because the content's online. It's not like, hey, the lecture's over. You better have learned because tomorrow we're moving on to a new topic. And then lastly, mastery-based instruction. Students get credit, not because of seat time in a classroom, but because they've demonstrated proficiency on the actual skills. I wanna emphasize, this is not my model. I didn't invent it. If you wanna learn more, please go check out modernclassrooms.org. And I'll talk more about why I like this model next. So if we think about the benefit from a teacher and a student perspective, if we move the lecture to before and after class, I as the teacher get to spend time getting to know my students. I can understand their strengths and needs and I can differentiate instruction accordingly. Students can then use precious class time together, collaborating with peer learning and practicing difficult problems together. If we allow for more flexible pacing, Teachers can differentiate. I can say, hey, I see that you've mastered this topic. Let's work on a stretch goal. I want you to work on a more advanced task. Or let's slow down and quick, do a quick review of this, this concept together. Students can then also build independent learning because it's not up to me to tell the student when to move forward. They get to take ownership over that learning path. And then lastly, if we assess based on mastery, not on completion, I, as the teacher, get much more data because I can kind of really figure out what my students know and what they need to work on. And then students get to make progress based on when they've mastered concepts and they build confidence along the way. Um, if this slide is overwhelming, that's okay. You can watch this again. You can check on Modern Classrooms. The biggest thing I wanna emphasize here is that as we move towards this kind of model, it frees up everybody's time because students can learn anytime, anywhere, and our time together can be spent on the more valuable process of building relationships, peer learning, collaboration, and practical applications. Um, a, spe a special note right now on mastery tracking, I'm a big fan of, uh, of what a mastery tracker can do. I'm going to put a template into chat right now please feel free to make a copy of this and you can use it in your own classroom. But simply put, a mastery tracker is great for nurturing independent learning. And it can be a, a simple spreadsheet, which is just like, hey, here are the skills I've mastered. Here's what I still need to work on. What I like about this is that it kind of battles that attitude. Like students come in and it's just like, okay, what are we gonna learn today, teacher? But when they have the information, they have to take ownership over it. It's something that they control. They sit down, they open up their mastery tracker, and then they make a decision about what they want to study and what they want to practice and how to work together with their student, with their fellow students and with the teacher. 
I do also want to emphasize that when I think about a mastery checker, assessments are important, but an assessment can be anything. It doesn't need to be a standardized multiple choice test. It can be a project, a problem set, an essay, a peer review, a class discussion, a self-assessment. There are so many different ways to measure learning that we should be thinking creatively about that because multiple choices test A, our students are tired of them, but B, they don't capture the full learning experience. And so let's be creative in, in how we think about assessing and measuring learning. So check out that link in chat. That's a free mastery checker that you can bring back to your own programs if you'd like. Um, so when I think about, hey, what is what are my students going to do at home? What are they going to do together? The question I ask is, what are the things that can't be done alone? Watching a lecture on YouTube, that's something a student can do on their own. They can rewatch it a few times. They can pause. They take, take notes. That means that our time together in class is the opportunity to build community, to have conversations, to do the things that can't be done alone. Historically, teachers had to be the source of explanations because we didn't have the internet. We didn't have YouTube, but we do now. So at the very least, it's an opportunity to rethink how do we spend our time together? What are the most impactful experiences that are gonna be engaging for students so they wanna come back to class? And then they can do the other things that they can do on their own at home and on their own time. So what does this look like? Here's a simple idea for getting it started. How about texting students a link? Say, hey, check out this video before we come to class. Five minute video, just watch it. If it makes no sense, that's okay. Because at least they have a foundation and they can come into the classroom with questions ready to go. So those of you that want to get started with this model, try this. Find a video on YouTube that you like that introduces the concept that you want to explore in class. Share it with students as a link, text it to them, email it to them, print it out on a piece of paper, and just say, hey, watch this video before you come to class. Then when they come into class, focus on the activities that can't be done alone. What are the interesting questions that students have? How can we pair them up for small group discussions and then report back on those conversations? So the idea with the YouTube video is just to get the lesson started so you can use that valuable time together for more different, interesting, and complex questions. Um, and then as a stretch, if you wanna take this model a little further, um, check out the Modern Classroom Project where you can try to pull from a little bit of each blended instruction, flexible pacing, and mastery-based learning. So with that, um, I want to kind of finish today's webinar by talking about 12 different strategies for how to start kind of engaging students in digital environments and helping support independent learning of digital skills. Before I do, I, I know engagement is a challenge out there. I just want to put a few questions out there for how you think about engagement. You know, we see that students are struggling in online environments or they aren't coming back to class. A few questions I would encourage you to, to think through are, have you taken your own lessons yourself? Do you find them interesting? Do you find them engaging? Or put another way, think about the times that you're excited to learn. Think about the times that you're excited to get online and talk to people. Those are the experiences we wanna capture and emulate. So, when I hear that engagement is a challenge, I don't think the problem is necessarily that um, X or Y or students with digital literacy. I think the challenge is how can we create learning activities that are exciting, that are meaningful, that are practical, that make students want to learn? Because I fundamentally believe all humans want to learn and all humans are good at learning. It's natural. It's inherent to our existence. So how can we bring that into the classroom because our students are already doing it on YouTube? Okay, so with that, like I said, 12 strategies, both big and small, for how to start building community and supporting digital literacy. Before we do that, one more digital literacy tip. Here is a great Chrome extension called Awesome Screenshot. I know everybody's always looking for different ways to create it, take a screenshot. What I like about this is that it's a Chrome extension and you can very quickly annotate, you can blur, you can highlight, and it's completely free. Like you can see, it just exists in the browser. 
I just click on this button right here and I click capture and then I can annotate from there. So check out Awesome Screenshot, great free program for creating screenshots. Okay, tip number one um, is, uh, excuse me, tip number two, I'm gonna come back to tip number one. Tip number two is talking partners. So create space for students to get to know each other. And this is especially helpful in a distance learning environment where students may not be ever seeing each other face to face. So the way we do this is we find, we take our class roster and pair all students up with each other. Give them a copy of each other's contact information and just say, hey, check in on each other, be an accountability partner for each other, create space for you guys to get to know each other. And this is what it looks like in our program. You know, Here are the talking partners. And we're just going to keep it unstructured, you know, text each other once a week, call each other once every two weeks, whatever feels accessible for you. And just say, hey, you know, I missed you in class this week. Everything OK? Or did you struggle with that lesson like I did? So talking partners, tip number two. Tip number one that I glossed over is digital literacy tips. So I think sharing tips like this is a great way to engage students because, A, it only takes two minutes. But B, this can be peer to peer. So start every class with a different student sharing a digital literacy tip. Like, here's how I use bookmarks. Here's how I use keyboard shortcuts. Here's how I send and receive emails. So every time we meet, we take two minutes and a different person is responsible for sharing a digital literacy tip like docs.new or awesome screenshot. So we have class for eight months or eight weeks. We meet twice a week. So there's 16 different digital literacy tips that again are short, they create community and they create an environment where students are seeing each other as experts and learning for each other, from each other. That's why I put digital literacy tips into my presentations because I do this with students and it usually goes pretty well as we create space for us to learn from each other. Okay, tip number three is to model what it looks like to say, I don't know, but here's how I'm going to figure it out. It's very common for students to enter our classrooms thinking we're the experts. But how many of you today think you would pass the math section, for example, of the GED? It's gotten significantly more rigorous, and we need to embrace the fact that when it comes to digital literacy, for example, we are learning alongside our students. So A, we want our students to realize that we might not be the experts anymore, and that's okay. But more importantly, we can teach a valuable lesson about how to become an independent learner. So if a student asks me how to do something and I don't know, I jump at that opportunity to say, hey, I don't know. I want them to see that it's OK to say I don't know. It's OK to not know how to do something. And then from there, I say, but here's how I'm going to try to figure it out. Here's what I'm going to Google. Here's what I'm going to look up on YouTube. Here's the website I found, but I'm not sure if it's accurate. This is how I'm going to try to like validate the information. I let them hear my thinking. So first, I let them, I give them permission to say, I don't know. It's okay. You don't have to be embarrassed. It's the 21st century. No one knows what they're doing. We're all trying to figure out this new world. And so I want them to see it's okay to say, I don't know. But it's important to then follow that up and say, here's how I'm going to try to figure it out. So saying I don't know isn't an invitation to give up. It's an opportunity to get started with that learning process so they can start to hear and see what that 21st century learning can look like. Okay, tip number four, this one's probably pretty obvious, but continue to move as much instruction online as possible. I know distance learning is challenging. I know blended learning is challenging. Um, but we need to engage our students and staff in digital environments. The internet can be truly transformative. I'm going to talk more about why I think that is as we wrap this presentation. But even if your campuses are reopening and students are coming back for face-to-face -face instruction, keep your instruction blended so students can learn anytime and anywhere. So we're engaging students in digital environments. You know, if we're trying to prepare our students for college and career readiness, I would argue that digital literacy is maybe the most important thing we need to focus on. And so we cannot revert to 2019 and before when we might not have been doing blended learning. Moving forward, 
all instruction needs to remain in a digital environment. And that can include in face-to-face -face classes where we have a computer, but then we break out for discussions and then we go back to technology. It's integrated into our classrooms. It's not separated. Um, continuing on that, that theme, uh, especially when COVID started, I've heard people being like, hey, when you started e-learn in Louisiana, were you doing synchronous or asynchronous? Were you doing live classes or self-paced? And I think that's, that's not the question we should be asking because we should be doing both. As we've seen, there are valuable learning activities that can be done alone, and there are things that can be done together. So in my mind, a good blended learning experience is both synchronous and asynchronous. We have content that exists in both spaces. Um, tip number five, consider a partnership between providers. Like I, we talked about, 80% of staff are part-time. We're learning digital environments together. Essentially, we're not setting our staff up to be successful. We're asking them to do too much. But in adult education, we are kind of lucky. We don't have the same, same accreditation issues that they have in higher ed. So why can't five different adult ed providers in a city or in a region or a state work together? share online classes, share courses that they've developed, share instruction and tutors across space because we have the internet that can build that bridge. So for example, here's one model of many that we've explored in Louisiana. And like I said, there's a lot of benefit to that. So we have a team of instructors. All they do is write curriculum. So we have courses that are built and designed in digital environments that we then freely share with other providers, which then allows their staff to focus on tutoring and social emotional support and goal setting and personalized feedback. Kind of more simply put, I don't think every adult ed provider needs to write their own curriculum. Let's find ways to partner, to work together, to share curriculum, because if we have a team that writes high quality courses and then designs them for Blackboard or Canvas or Google Classroom, we can then freely use them across our different, different uh, sites. That frees our time to get to know students and spend more time building quality relationships, which is what this slide looks like, that kind of localized coaching experience. Um, okay, continuing on, tip number six, spend time inspiring students. We're all spending so much time in front of screens right now. And I know it's exhausting because we're just interacting with robots, but let's remind everyone how awesome the internet can be. I know technology is frustrating. I know it can be challenging and difficult, but it's also pretty incredible. I mean, with Google Maps, I can get free directions anywhere, by car, by train, by bike, by plane, immediately. Duolingo is a free app that allows me to learn languages from home. I can lay in bed learning Spanish. Um, I can go to edX and take thousands of college classes for free. The internet's amazing. So let's just remember to take a few minutes in our classes to inspire students and to show them crash course. Let's show them Duolingo and let's say, hey, look at how awesome the internet is. Because if our students walk out inspired about the internet, they're going to do the work from there. They're going to go deep onto Wikipedia. They're going to browse YouTube. They will carry that forward. We just need to spend a few minutes getting them excited and get that ball rolling. So that's what I do in my classes is once a week. I take two minutes and I'm just like, hey, let me show you this cool website. Check out Duolingo. It's awesome. There's a free app. Download it on your phone. Or check out Coursera or Code Academy or any of these great websites just to be like, hey, I know the internet's overwhelming, but it's also pretty awesome. And let's not forget how extraordinary it can be if we know how to go to the right places. Okay, tip number seven. When I was trained as a teacher, I was taught this model. I do, we do, you do. What that means is, let's say we're practicing how to take a screenshot. I'm going to show students how to take a screenshot. Then we're going to practice taking screenshots together. And then they're going to try it on their own. I think this reinforces dependent learning because by, struct, by the structure of itself, they're waiting for me to show them step by step how to do something. It reinforces that dependent learning. So what I'd like to propose is you actually invert that. So what I do in my classroom, let's say I'm introducing how to use Google Classroom. 
These students have never seen Google Classroom before. So what we'll do is I'll introduce, hey, here's Google Classroom. Take two minutes and just explore it on your own. I'm not gonna show you anything. Spend two minutes clicking around, trying each link, going back and forth. Just see what you can find on your own. If you get lost, that's okay. Just poke around and see what you can do. Two minutes, no more. Then take 30 seconds, talk to your neighbors, show each other what that you found and what was helpful, what you're still curious about. And then after both of those tasks, I will then do a tour of the website. Everything I just described maybe takes three minutes. But the idea here is that A, you do, it encourages them to try new things, to be explorers, to click on new things and be okay with getting lost. Then the we do part is, please get comfortable talking to your neighbors, learning from each other. We are all teachers. We are all students. We are all learning together. And then at the end is when I'll model a few skills. That's how we start to nurture this independent learning. Just try something on your own before I show you how to do it and build confidence that when you see a new website, when you learn a new app, you can just get started, click around, tap on things, try to figure it out. And then after you've explored, ask questions to your neighbors, look up things on YouTube, look up things on Google. And uh, yeah, I've been doing this inversion in my classroom for several years now. Um, and every time it's just like, hey, try things on your own for a little bit. Don't get overwhelmed. If you get stuck, that's fine. Just raise your hand and we'll kind of poke around together. So try consider or consider inverting. You do first on your own, then we'll do it together then I will show you how to do something. Okay, tip number eight, which is uh, collaborative updates. Instead of using email for your program updates, use Google Docs. It's collaborative. Students can ask questions. So when we have a class homepage or when I want to share updates, I'll just send an email that says, here's the link. And then students can ask questions. They can post comments. It's a two-way conversation which is similar to class number nine, or update number nine, which is do anything but email. We use Slack, we use Microsoft Teams, anything that changes it from like a top-down conversation to a peer-to-peer -peer conversation. Um, tip number 10, this one's for staff out there. Get on Twitter, get on LinkedIn. I know social media can be frustrating, it can be overwhelming, but when I got on social media for my career, it transformed because I could now learn from a global community. I, a lot of these ideas that you're seeing in the presentation, I've learned from colleagues on Twitter that I've never met before because it's great to learn from our colleagues locally. But remember, everybody around the country is struggling right now. We're trying to figure out distance learning. We're trying to figure out engagement. It's a challenge for all of us. So let's get online and build a community where we can learn from each other collectively. So I highly recommend jump on Twitter, follow CoAbe, check out who CoAbe follows. So you can find more people that might be interesting and just look for good content and start posting yourself because it's a great way to create a global community of peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, tip number 11, remember to survey your students, ask them what they like, what they find engaging. If you're struggling to find engagement, get students involved because ultimately it's not what we find interesting, it's what's engaging and accessible for them. One note though, is that if you are gonna survey, make sure you share the results. There's nothing more frustrating to me than, let's say a company asks for my opinion, but then they don't tell me at all what they're gonna do with that feedback. I get frustrated and I kind of give up on it. So when I survey students, I publish a report and I said, hey, here's what I learned from the survey. Here's what we're gonna do differently as a result. So in conclusion, I wanna remind everyone, hey, we're all teachers, we're all students, we're all learning together in the 21st century. Ultimately, I think we need to rethink our core model of what a teacher looks like and how we're engaging students and the staff in a way that really prepares people for the future of work, the future of learning. Um, quick summary of just kind of some where to get started ideas. Um, focus on the growth mindset. It's okay to make some mistakes. We wanna model what it looks like to say, I don't know. Move the lecture to before and after class. You can spend time together on the much more important task of relationship building and peer learning and so forth. 
start anywhere. There were probably 20 different ideas in this presentation. If one idea was exciting to you, that's awesome. Run with it. We can't fix the world overnight. Start small, expect to make mistakes. Remember that when we started our distance learning model, we retained 3% of our students. We were not doing well. The key was to keep learning, keep talking to students. And remember that our North Star is aspirational. We're never going to kind of be perfect. So we're just kind of constantly trying to get a little bit better over time and grow from there. Um, there's some great resources that I've curated here in case you want to check these out more. These will be in the slides and in the follow-ups. You can check those out when you get a chance. Um, just a quick overview, modern classrooms where they have a free class where you can learn more about kind of mastery learning, flexible pacing, and um, the blended classroom or high flex classroom. Um, and then a few, a few articles that kind of look at how to get started bringing that mastery learning to your environment. Um, I will finish by saying that this year I, I, I partnered up with someone and we started a new website, communitylearningpartners.com. Um, and we'd be excited to talk to you if you want to look at curriculum development, professional learning like this, technology integration projects, and or data dashboards. So please feel free to kind of get in touch at communitylearningpartners.com. And of course, I'm going to finish with one more tip. So those of you that use Google Drive a lot, it can be frustrating to search through how much content we have in our drives. So did you know that you can just view all docs at once or all sheets at once or all slides at once? Here's a great play way to do that. You can put these search chips in so you're just filtering by docs or by slides or by sheets and it kind of filters out and it gives you the opportunity to see um, just those files themselves. So with that, I just wanna remind you, hey, you're all doing great, I promise you. Engagement is a challenge around the country. None of us know best practices yet. So please try to stay positive. Take time to be proud of all the progress you've made in the last year and a half. March 2020 was a challenge and we adapted and it may not have been perfect, but we're learning, our students are learning alongside of us. So please, if you have any questions, hang out, get in touch with any of my contact information on screen. I would love to hear what's working for you, what's not working for you, so we can learn from our mistakes and learn collaboratively. Um, so I hope you found something today that's exciting, that feels good, and please get in touch. I would love to have a conversation after today. And I do see a few questions in the Q&A, so I'm just gonna go through those one by one now. Um, do you keep the digital literacy tips? Cindy, yes, if you go, uh, great question. Let me see how quickly I can find this. Um, I post a lot of my digital literacy tips to my Twitter account. So if you go on to Twitter and go to my media tab, you'll see a lot of digital literacy tips like this. For example, how to make images look better in a presentation. So I put a lot of those directly on Twitter. Good question. Um, what is the funding model for local sites versus lead agency in Louisiana? Great question. So students that enroll locally are treated as locally enrolled students. And then we at Delgado get supplemental funding um, from the state to provide those. But with that said, there's a lot of different ways to braid funding streams to make a partnership model work. And I'd be happy to kind of brainstorm with you. So simply put, local students are funded locally and then we provide all the instruction and then we do fundraising collectively and get philanthropic and co corporate support. Um, continuing on, because as you mentioned, many of our volunteers and instructors are in the process of developing their own digital literacy skills. Do you have any recommendations for building these independent learner skills? Great question. Yeah, the first one is just do digital literacy tips. Start every staff meeting and require each staff to share a different digital literacy tip. So we start once a week and today it's Joey's day. Next week, it's Shane's day. The week after that, it's Courtney's day. Just have everyone get in the habit of asking each other questions and sharing ideas. And then secondly, uh, as another way to kind of nurse that, really focus in on what you want your staff spending to do. Because in my experience, a lot of programs are asking teachers to do too much and it doesn't give them time and space to learn new digital skills. So what is the role of a teacher? Is it to write curriculum? Is it to teach online? Is it to build relationships? Try to remove as much as you can from their plate so they can focus on building a relationship. Um, what would you recommend for very low level ESL and digital literacy students who work at Night Tired? 
I got to be honest, I've actually never taught ESL. My background in adult education is in um, like co-enrollment. So IET programming and then GED, high psychology and career. It's all I've ever taught. So I have to defer to many other uh, people because I can't, I've never, never really talked about, uh, um, never taught ESL. I know nothing about it. For digital literacy, the biggest thing I'd recommend is try inverting instruction. Don't show students how to do things at first. Give them a chance to just play and be okay with making mistakes to nurture that growth mindset. Yes, it will be overwhelming at first. The first time you ask students to do something on their own, they're going to not do it. They're going to not try. But each time they practice, they'll get a little more confident. So you got to be ready for a little bit of pushback. And they might be a little frustrated. But over time, they're going to build confidence as those independent explorers and independent learners. Um, can I get a list of the forms.new, sheets.new? Yeah, so um, actually any Google, uh, any Google app. So docs.new, sheets.new, slides.new, forms.new, sites.new, that's the whole list right there. Um, I have concerns about leaving the really low students behind while upper students make progress. How do I deal with this in your model? Yeah, great. So in my experience, high level students um, are often struggling with confidence. They test at a high level, but they don't believe they're at a high level. I mean, how many of you have students that are ready for the GED, but don't think they're ready for the GED? So the way I approach a multi-level classroom is A, interesting questions that anybody can answer, and B, I pair them up. Low-level students learn from high-level students that can kind of provide pointers, and then high-level students build confidence because they're like, hey, I'm kind of a teacher right now. I'm kind of a tutor and they learn by trying to explain to others. Um, maybe the role of a teacher has changed in the 21st century, that felt really profound. Thank you, Rachel, I appreciate it. I agree, I hope if I had to emphasize anything from today's presentation, it might be that um, we can't teach the way we were taught, which is strange because now we have to teach something in a way that we've never learned. And that's where it's essential to get online and learn from each other and be okay failing. Try something new, see how it goes. And if it goes terribly, that's okay. Just reflect and see what you can learn from it. Um, and I see a lot of people saying, will this presentation be, be emailed? Yes, um, please talk to Coabe. All the presentation materials will be available online. The presentation will be posted um, as a, in addition to the recording. So you can check it out all there. Okay, I think that was all of the questions, but I'm happy to hang out for a couple of minutes in case anyone wants to chat more. Um, but please get in touch. Any questions, comments, I'd be happy to talk more after today. Hope you all have a great day. Please have a good afternoon. And I will look forward to hopefully talking to you all soon. Take care, everybody.